Dr. Ngozi, can you talk about a moment uh, during your uh, period where you were a minister both from finance and also foreign ministry, where you almost felt like you needed to give up, where things were so bad, where you were like, I'm just not going to be able to do this. And what led you to go back and keep fighting? Mm -hmm. The second time around, when I was asked to come back, I saw that some of the things that we needed to finish in terms of transformation were linked to strengthening and building institutions and fighting corruption, which was one of the plans. Yes. And enthroning transparency into government so that, so that leaders can be held accountable. And this applies anywhere. Where you don't have transparency, there's no way you can hold leaders accountable for change. Exactly. So I, I, I went back, and one of the things that we were doing as a country, as you see now, is still relevant today, we subsidized the price of petroleum at the pump. And you can see the riots all around the world, right? That you have today, because people are trying to increase the price of petrol, the gilets jaunes in France, in Ecuador, and everywhere. So we were subsidizing, and this was really hitting the fiscal, the finances of the country. We were spending up, up to 5% of GDP, or almost $13 billion on these subsidies. And they were no longer sustainable. But the subsidies seemed to be increasing at a very rapid rate, you know, out of sync with what we thought was the growth in demand. And so when I came, I asked the president if we could audit the payments we make, because we would pay importers. We produce uh, crude oil, but our refining capacity only meets about 20% of the needs. So we have to also export and then buy refined petroleum. And so those who import the refined ones, would, we, they would sell at a subsidized price, and the government would reimburse them the subsidy. And it was this subsidy that was escalating. So I said, could we audit? the subsidy payments, just to see if everything was OK. And he said, fine. So we audited $8.5 billion worth of payments, and we found $2.5 billion worth of fraud. So we, the president, President Goodluck Jonathan, then strongly, I said to him, we can't pay, and he backed it 100%. And we told these importers, you know, let me just give you one example of the type of fraud. They said a ship delivered oil or refined oil to the country on a particular day. And, you know, of course, the auditors went to look at whether the delivery happened. And we found, for example, that a ship that was supposedly on Nigeria's shore delivering oil, we looked at Lloyd's Register tracks the movement of all ships in the world. And that ship was not in Nigeria, it was in China. Wow. So obviously, it was not delivering the oil. So those were the kinds of things. So when we refused to pay, I didn't really think, I thought oh, we'll have a battle with these, the people. But what happened next was that on a fine Sunday morning in 2012, November, I got a phone call, December, that my mother had been kidnapped. So my 83-year-old mother, who was coming home from church, saw a car entering the compound where she lived with my father in, in, in the village. And some, a young man jumped out of the car and said to her, are you the mother of the minister? And she was very happy, you know. She thought it was someone coming to congratulate <laughs> her, as people would do, or your daughter is doing a good job. And the person slapped her and pushed her inside the car, and she was taken. So I was in my house in Abuja. My brother called me to say, that he had very bad news. My mother had been kidnapped. My father wasn't there because he was attending a conference in another part of the country. And so we thought it was just one of these kidnappings for money. My father came uh, and joined me where I was in Abuja. And he said, well, let's get ready because you're the finance minister. It's going to be a very heavy demand. But what happened when they finally called my brother with their demands? It was that I should go to television and radio and resign publicly and leave the country. Wow. And I should go back to the US where I had been working at the World Bank and stay there. 
So it was one of, to cut a long story short, it was one of the worst moments of my life. Because you, when you grow up, you think of taking care of your parents. You don't think of being the cause of their demise. And left alone, I would have gone and resigned. But my father insisted that I not do so. And he had this joke that he and my mother were really past their life expectancy. So there were no more of use to anyone. So if, we had to, if she had to go, I should, I should not give in. So that was a very, one of the most difficult moments in trying to implement a change and a reform that I ever encountered. The end of the story is good. The president and everybody, there was a huge turnout beating the bushes looking for these people. And at the end of five days, I think the heat got so much. So somehow she was able to escape from where she was. And she's still alive today. Um, I must say that she also has the second book that is called Fighting Corruption is Dangerous, which is really a very courageous book for her to write. And I want to acknowledge you for that. Well, thank you for advertising my books. <laughs> they are both MIT Press. They are public policy books on Amazon. <laughs> yes. So.